Hello, everyone. My name is Alessandro Ruggero. I'm the director of the Instituto Italiano di Cultura, and I'm very pleased to be here with you today for this second installment of the series of webinars of online conversation that started last week. Uh, and the title of the series is uh, Void, Body, Breath, and Care for Conversation on a Changing World Between Italy and Canada. For each conversation, we have two different speakers. Today is the turn of body as a team. And um, the two speakers are Zabna Bungo and Chiara Capelletti. Zabna Bungo from Montreal and Chiara Capelletti from, from, uh, <clears throat> from uh, Milano. Uh, here with me is Sasha Hastings. Uh, as I mentioned last time, if you haven't been with us, I mean, I, I brief uh, told us how did we get to the decision and we started to organize this series of, uh, of conversation. I will just say a few words. I mean, of course, the, the starting point was the, um, the outbreak of the, of the pandemic and, and, uh, and the very personal experience uh, that we all had to go through in the state of confinement. Uh, so the everyday experience, I would say, in terms of physical experience, in experiencing the space in a different way that we have done as we have done before. And also the psychological experience um, of experiencing the, the of have to face a situation that was really unprecedented and, and, and unclear. Having said that, I would like to say that the, the way we have shaped out the, the conversation is not really about the pandemic. So the, when we first started to, to talk, and when I say we, it is with, I mean, um, Sasha Hastings and Francesca Molteni, the, the two curators that uh, luckily decided to join the Instituto in working on this uh, project, decided to keep a little bit of a different angle and right, starting from the experience of the pandemic, but then try to explore uh, and, use, and choose four different um, keywords in order to have some sort of cardinal preferences in order to orient a sort of uh, um, conversation about the new reality and about how, what is the world and how is our personal relation with, with the space, so with the void, with our own body and with the body of others. So the physical connection and um, and the relation with our own body, and then the breath, of course, as the relation that we have with the outside, and uh, of course the, the breath is also the medium how we have been infected by the COVID. So there is always this sort of this relation with the with the reality of the of the COVID, the reality we are uh, unfortunately still in uh, right now. And then the last conversation um, will be uh, care. So how to take care of us, ourselves, and the, uh, and the people that we care of, we care for. I'm very, very happy that we could, uh, that the Instituto could uh, have uh, the involvement and the help of uh, two really outstanding uh, curators that we had the opportunity to work with uh, before in different occasions. Last webinar was moderated by, by um, and curated by Francesca Molteni, and this one uh, by Sasha Hastings that is here with me. Sasha is, has been working as a producer for CBC um, and uh, has been <clears throat> also working as a curator for different cultural programs for CBC and is a curator. And um, we met uh, because she had this, uh, this uh, period in, uh, in Venice, in Italy, at the University of Architecture. So two friends we can encounter. It was a very lucky meeting, I would say, because then we had the opportunity to work together on different projects here at the Instituto. And uh, Sasha is curating, curated the, the, an incredible uh, project for the Biennale three years ago, I think, that was called The Evidence Room and the Biennale of Architecture and is working uh, on curating another another project for the um, Canadian Pavilion, I think, for the Venice Biennale, hopefully 2021, let's see. So thank you to all of you for, for being present. I'm sure it will be an intriguing conversation <clears throat> between two outstanding speakers. You can um, 
participate in the conversation using the tool, uh, the Q&A tool that you can find at the bottom of your uh, screen. And uh, that's it on my, on my side. So I'm very pleased to give the floor to Sasha Hastings to present the, today's webinar and to introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Sasha. Well, thank you, Alessandro, and it's always a pleasure to do work with the Italian Cultural Institute. Um, I'd like to thank also my co-curator, uh, Francesca uh, Molteni, and of course, welcome Zab Mabungo, who's, jo uh, Mabungo, who's joining us from Montreal, and Chiara Capaletto, who is uh, with us in Milan. And of course, a big welcome to all of you, our audience. Um, if, you were, if you were with us for last week's conversation, you'll already know the format of the webinar. Um, I'll say a few words of, about the theme of body, and then I'll introduce Sav and Chiara. And uh, as Alessandra mentioned, um, they'll, they'll, they'll each give a short presentation, I'll lead a short discussion, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions through the, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So um, this week we move from the theme of void to the theme of body. Um, we all have one, it's how we inhabit the world. And yet I think um, very often a lot of us take it for granted. Uh, COVID-19 has made us much more conscious of the body's power, but also of its vulnerabilities and its frailties. We rely on it for life itself, for, for mobility, for self-expression, uh, for, for communicating with others, and for, of course, pleasure and intimacy. The physical restrictions and constraints of COVID-19 has made us uh, and is making us rethink and re-experience our relationships with ourselves and with others as we live them through our bodies. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think many people are feeling isolated and alienated these days, at least part of the time. And so-called social or physical distancing is having an effect on mental health as well. Human beings, as we know, are designed to be social and communal and physical creatures. This may also be playing itself out in social cohesion and in politics, national and international. But I'm also curious if there's some opportunities here. So to talk more about this, um, we're now joined by Zab Mabungu and Chiara Capaletto. Zab Mabungu is a dancer, choreographer, teacher, writer, and philosophy of French and Congolese origin. She's the founder and artistic director of Zab Mabungu, Compagnie Danse Niata Niata in Montreal. Zab is a companion of the Ordre des Arts et des Lettres du Québec and a winner of the 2020 Governor General's Performing Arts Award. She's known for her intensely physical and dynamic works that explore the capacity of movement to express what she calls our situation in the world. Chiara Capelletto is an assistant professor of aesthetics in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Milan, where she also uh, earned her PhD. She's held visiting fellowships at the Free University of Berlin, Columbia, Princeton, and the Institute for Advanced Studies in Paris. Chiara has written and edited several books and is the author of many papers. Her most recent research focuses on empathy and fiction in the performing arts, visual studies, poetics and rhetoric, the aesthetics of theater, and neuroaesthetics. So welcome to both of you. Um, Zab, I want uh, if if uh, if you could now turn on uh, your your uh, your mic and your uh, video. Um, you've prepared a short presentation for us, and I wonder if you might uh, share it with us now. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, very uh, pleased to meet all of you, and. Um, you may see that I have called my presentation Vibrant Distancing, Distance Vibrante, um, which is kind of strange um, after what we've just, uh, uh, you've just said and exposed regarding uh, this feeling of alienation that we all feel uh, because of this uh, distancing that has been forced upon us. And yet, I do call it Vibrant Distancing, if you can montrer la photo, uh, because I am here trying to um, present an idea of distancing that is very dynamic, um, that shows uh, strong connections. Um, basically, distancing or distance is an idea, uh, it's a principle that is at the heart, I would say, of the capacity we have of moving and thinking. 
And moving and thinking is dense. It's probably why most traditional ancient societies knew that uh, in order to fully grasp our capacity to move into the world, we needed to dance, that it was one and the same thing. So here you see this picture of two, uh, two interpreters who are moving and exchanging, and yet you can very well see the distance between them. It is really active. The distance is active, literally. So there is an idea that we are experiencing distance uh, outside as well as inside. And maybe that this situation that we are going through is renewing our capacity to feel those distances, but in a dynamic way, in a vibrant way, in a way that makes us connected. That is the first idea that we need to, uh, to sort of start thinking about in a new way. This habituation of distancing is really the practice of a dancer. Tu peux montrer l'autre photo. Um, how would we be able to dance in space if we did not practice distance? Two interpreters here are very dynamically engaged personally and together. So to distance ourselves is to also be autonomous. You develop your autonomy, you develop the sense you have of your own body. And um, Sasha, you talked earlier on of the fact that we are taking the body for granted, definitely. That's one thing that I keep saying to the dancers each time. That do not take your body for granted because it has to constantly renew itself as a body. It has to practice the distancing inside and the distancing outside. So then, then again, thinking about the COVID, thinking about this pandemic that is isolating us, we need to again reflect about isolation and loneliness, which is uh, uh, maybe not the same thing, the fact that we're isolated or we're alone. When you're alone, you are experiencing your body in space. But living in a society, to be alone is to be alone with others, is to learn with this distance between us and the others, how we can have our own identity and yet be connected to others. And of course, evolve within that relationship because it's not a fixed or defined, definitely defined relationship. It is something that constantly evolves with movement. Tu peux montrer là. So an idea of this, um, this, this video is, um, silent on purpose. Even though there's music, as you can see, they may, there's a cellist playing, uh, but I decided to not uh, let the music uh, be heard so that you could see the elements of distancing and how this distancing is being literally practiced in order to maintain the shape of things, to maintain our capacity to relate to things. Again, an example of this distancing. So we might see it uh, today with what happens. We have to, of course, think about our capacity to renew this way of distancing ourselves, um, which means living. How are we going to live with a capacity to distance, basically experience the distancing in a different way so that we can keep on seeing our relationship to others and reflect on it. And here I'm moving into a, what I suggest to be what we're gonna have to absolutely do and what we're doing today when we're exchanging uh, across the ocean, ocean we are exchanging our capacity to reflect on a situation. To reflect on a situation, which is to think about what is happening, to think about how we are situated in the world is something now that shouldn't be seen as separate. This is what people tend to see, especially in the Western world, as being separated from the life of the body, the physical body. You think and then you move. No, 
uh, thinking and moving are intertwined and this is the time where we're going to experience that. The, the thinking is an action that we take in order to understand our living and move into it. So when we move and that we think and that we experience the distancing and we experience our relationship to others, we encounter multiplicity, the multiplicity that is inherent to the world, to the way the world is, to what we think as reality. Now, how capable are we to relate to the multiplicity is something, again, that needs to be readdressed. How do we see that multiplicity? Is it the neighbor that is just living by me, near me, or am I interacting with the neighbor? How am I interacting with the neighbor? This is what people have been discovering during the, uh, the, the, the COVID-19, when they say, I never knew that neighbor. And now we're exchanging garlic and salt, and uh, uh, it's nice. And, and people are dancing on their balcony, and other neighbors, instead of screaming and saying that it makes noise, are looking and watching. Uh, we're doing this. Are these just survival tactics? Certainly they are. Um, are they defining something that has happened or should have happened a long time ago that has been uh, basically around us all the time, but we've been blind to it? We have been taking for granted or simply ignoring uh, ways of relating that yet do make, do give sense and meaning to uh, our lives. Now, this multiplicity that is at the same time Again, sending us back to our capacity to be alone is what makes us capable of thinking new ways of living, new ways of understanding life and uh, our relationship to reality. Thinking here becomes dynamic. If, if I can talk about dynamic thinking, uh, maybe I talk as a dancer, but this is how I see thinking, uh, contrary to what, uh, you know, the, the, the person who's isolated in the office and, and, and writing and thinking deeply, you know, that, that's the, the posture of the thinker who's, who's, uh, who's really introspective. Well, introspection is dynamic. And certainly, uh, this is the times for us to start seeing it that way. Being a body is a performance in itself. There I go. This is basically what I mean by all those things that I'm saying. The fact of being alive and having a body in itself is a performance. In everything we can understand of what it is to be a performance is already contained in the fact that we are alive and in a body. Having to, um, to take care, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about care, take care of that body. Take care of that body is being in charge, being able to take charge of your body and of its relations. And in doing that, we will be able to renew, to present, to have a new solidarity. Vibrant distancing calls from a new form of solidarity, a new way of relating, resonating here to relate and to resonate is uh, very much uh, integral to the body. When I relate, I resonate with a body that has the capacity to resonate. And this is what we are called now to do. We have to start renewing our capacity to resonate and relate to others. A new sense of connectivity, maybe, hopefully, is on the way. It already, has already started. So, c'est ça? Mm -hmm. I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, Zab, thank you. That was absolutely terrific. Very, very passionate and inspiring. Um, and it really makes you feel like, my God, there are so many uh, opportunities here that, we, that we're not even thinking about. And that if we just start to think about things in a different way, maybe, maybe this isn't the absolute worst thing that could happen. Um, so um, then uh, I'd like to uh, go to Chiara 
Um, you've also prepared a short presentation and um, perhaps you could share that with us now and then um, Zab and I will turn our, our mics and videos off while you, while you present and then we'll, we'll come back in for a conversation. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you, Zab, for, for your words and, your, and the videos that you just showed. And I'm afraid my, my dry words will be less uh, inspiring than, than what you just said. Uh, but I'll, I'll start, however, on with the first line, the first thought that I have prepared for our discussion, and which is, can my house expand? Can it collapse onto me? I think that first experience that we had, at least my first experience during the social distancing, um, was a, an absolute loneliness. And social distancing meant uh, basically be lonely and living by yourself at home. And we, I think that we discovered that our home sweet home was uh, absolutely unable to, um, to react, to respond with our living bodies, with my personal body and the bodies of the other people that were sharing their time and day and night. Uh, with me because we weren't prepared. Our daily experience, our culture uh, was very, um, uh, let's say we weren't trained enough to be so close all together in the same space. And uh, um, having a, a, a huge home, of course, or a home huge enough, has been a privilege that few people um, had and have. And I think this is one, one point to be, to be discussed in the time to come. Uh, how, how, how much space do we need? How much private space do we need? How much public space do we need in order to be um, healthy, basically, both psychologically and, and bodily. Uh, my second point is about care. I know that there will be a, a, a whole uh, session on care, but um, this point is for me a political one. And uh, the ongoing pandemic shows us governments as institutional actors whose power to lead lies unexpectedly, I think, uh, in their capacity for care and protection. And I am in favor of rethinking political action as an exercise in care, because it would entail uh, an ecological and feminist and intergenerational agenda. Um, who, I mean, and, and would acknowledge that citizens are an aggregate of women and men and children and all people with different potentialities and different abilities and disabilities. But nevertheless, uh, while care uh, as an active and mutual practice is a positive and productive engagement, uh, being taken into care suggests an attitude of, of passivity that weakens I think personal initiative and this freedom to, to try and to fail. Uh, and for me, this is a very uh, troubling point. And I think that political discourse uh, all around the world is really, um, is challenged by the, by the question of the care and uh, the passivity. And the, there is a polarity between activity and passivity uh, within the care. Um, framework. And my third point is family, because during the lockdown, we have been told to stay home and to stay with our family. And the family was thought of as the legal one, your husband, your wife, your children. Um, is this really what a family is? I, do, I, I, I deeply disagree. Uh, I think that friends are part of my family and 
the, the idea that uh, suddenly family has become again something that the law establishes as an institutional, uh, as, a, as a society which is institutionalized, uh, this switch has been extremely violent. And I think that men, and I'm not just talking about the fact that, of course, um, there are there are family uh, in which abuses are are present. I'm not just talking about these extreme cases of uh, violence and misconduct. I'm talking about normal families, like nice families. Uh, that I think show have shown all their um, weakness somehow. The fact that we they are not we are not any more uh, educated to live with our family, and that's it. And but if you, if you think about this question in a more positive way, uh, I think that this period is a period in which during which we can. Um, enhance the idea of friendish of friendship and open up the boundaries once again and say loudly what a family can be and need uh, to be. Uh, what if I was not the citizens you imagined? Uh, I was struck by the fact that, uh, at least in Italy, uh, when the government told us uh, to stay home. Well, uh, the, the, the citizen that was imagined was uh, implicitly a male, a uh, healthy one, um, somebody who had a nice house, a good job, no people to, to, to protect, um, no children, no... Um, it, it was a, a perfect lonely, lonely, lonely and, and safe and wealthy man. Uh, this was implied. Of course, nobody told, said it. Nobody. Uh, it, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't. It has never been um, said like that. But in fact, all the political actions that have been taken uh, were based on this presumption. Um, and the, uh, this idea uh, of uh, citizenship is very abstract. And uh, somehow, while we were at home to protect our bodies, we were imagined as angels, as abstract people with no uh, needs, no, no bodily needs, uh, no desires, uh, no passions. Um, I think something between angels and and uh, animals, and that was of course paradoxical and tragic. So masks. When we think about mask, and of course the mask is the, the more um, popular object uh, these days. When we think about masks, we are said that masks hide our identity because our identity uh, is supposed to be internal uh, and the only way to have access to it is looking at our faces and see who we are through our facial expressions. Um, I deeply disagree with that. I think that masks are foremost prosthesis, uh, are prosthetic devices. And when we, um, when we use them, we, uh, change our bodily movements. We interact differently with our um, environment and with our body itself and with other people. I think that wearing a mask uh, means to see um, less, uh, to move uh, uh, in a, somehow with some uncertainty, to fall down. Uh, uh, why so? I mean, the mask is shouldn't uh, be, shouldn't cover only our mouth and our nose. Of course not. Uh, masks are much more powerful um, tools than makeup somehow than, than that. 
And so when, when we wear a mask, we are not hiding our identity, we are changing our, our behavior, our personal and social behavior because masks affect our, our bodily performances. And my last point is about war. Uh, everybody says that we are, there is a war, we, a war that we have to fight and to win. I think this is completely wrong and misleading. Uh, because if, I, I mean, the first question is against whom? Uh, the virus has been treated as a, as, a as, as a social agent, while it's not. And uh, so, and the virus, of course, is, is, I mean, we are the virus in the sense that the virus is, in a, is affect us. Uh, so thinking about all the, all, about this pandemic as a, as a war means that we, there is an enemy and we have to fight it. But to fight an enemy that is embodied means to fight the other people. Um, and this is both misleading and very dangerous. And I will stop here. All right, thank you, Chiara. That was terrific. Um, very, very interesting. I'm especially interested in your uh, idea of the, the mask as a prosthesis. Um, so uh, we now have, um, Zab, you can rejoin the conversation now uh, with the video and audio. Um, we have uh, just about, not quite half an hour now for a conversation. Um, and a reminder to our audience, if you have any questions uh, for Zab or Chiara, please, uh, add them to the little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you're directing them to one or the other, please just let us know um, who, who you're directing them to. Um, so uh, Zab, I think I'd like to um, ask you the first question. Um, I think most people, unless they are dancers or performers or athletes, as we've said, just aren't that conscious of their bodies. Um, that has changed with COVID and there's this, there's this intense vulnerability and we're now trying to protect ourselves from this, you know, this microscopic intruder that we can't see by, by putting on masks, by washing our hands, by, you know, putting on the, the, the hand sanitizer. And it seems to me, it's almost like putting on a suit of armor. And, um, and so you have this new barrier between people, you have this new constraint. And I think, you know, probably as a dancer, you're always dealing with barriers and constraints. But I'm wondering how, how do you, can you talk a bit about how you as a, as a dancer respond to barriers and constraints? Yes, well, first, I have a lot of different masks. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's the first thing my friends notice. You're changing masks all the time. It's like I was basically bothering everybody coming with colors and, and different, uh, you know, masks. You know, making sure that, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be identified just with the same mask all the time. But uh, truly, um, this is about first of all um, making sure that uh, I walk outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, I happen to be used to confinement as a choreographer and as a creator in dance. I work in the studio in a space, a so-called empty space, which, which is another discussion because I don't believe in empty space, but anyway, so-called empty space, that is the studio where you have to move and be with yourself and explore movement with yourself. So I'm used to that. In that sense, there hasn't been something totally strange for me, I have to say. And, but going outside, breathing, the air, walking uh, has been very important to maintain the contact. So we have to understand that talking to re about relating to others, um, um, making sure that we are now renewing our connectivity to others can only happen if we renew our connectivity to nature, which has been seriously put in danger. And nature is all around us, which means I'm talking to you right now, I'm in an office, but there is nature in that office. And the, this nature is not just the plants, it is me breathing. Carla near me was breathing. 
we have a body, so we are connected to nature. We, we are nature. So walking is putting back in shape that nature that has either sits in the office, sits at home, walks to go to the bank, does this and that. So it is about this, this ancient old way of human beings to walk, um, basically walk and sing while they're walking. I mean, if you look at the griots in Africa, this is literally, and even in Congo where I come from, we create music while walking. And what happens, the various events that occur during the, 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 on the way are integrated in the music, whether it's this bird, that's what, whether it's somebody who's calling you and saying hello and you stopped and then you walk again. This is part of the music you're going to create. So walking outside, basically putting your body where it belongs, you know, among things that move is the key thing. And I believe that every one of us are perfectly capable of doing that. When you're saying people do not dance, do not do that, there's one thing I say all the time, everybody, everyone is a dancer, whether they like it or not. It is something that I dare say openly, uh, forcibly with force that everybody is a dancer. That's what is a human being. A human being moves and thinks and that's what dance is about. And this is why animals who dance have some kind of thinking also. You know, they relate to some kind of ways of thinking that we still try to understand uh, 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 scientifically. The mystery of our thinking is in our body moving, you see? So we can all do that. So if you have to go to the bathroom, make sure that you're doing some steps and you're dancing going to your bathroom. You know, so people should just get rid of the shame of these ideas that they have, that they are expert dancers, and I am not a dancer, and I do not know how to move, and I don't have rhythm. All of these are lies, the false representations of who we are. So I don't know if I've answered to you, but that's, for me, the fundamental base from which to start again, I would say. Not start, but start again, because we have been doing it. It's ancestral, but we have lost it. We've, we've, we've put it on the side, and, and to dance, is related to in entertainment. So I would just quickly say something about entertainment because the area of entertainment has been sort of stopped. In Quebec, there's a new uh, rule that stops you know, any kind of performance anywhere, so there's no entertainment. So what do we mean by entertainment? You know, do we, how is entertainment related to life? How is life related to entertainment? How do we entertain ourselves? Is this about just entertaining or is entertainment is beyond life or afterlife or with life? You know, what do we mean by that? So, um, yes, let's get down and let's move. Well, it sounds like we just have to move. And I mean, whether it means you go outside for a walk, oh, yeah. we are confined to your apartment because, of course, the Italians had one of the hardest lockdowns yeah. in, in the world. We at least were allowed to go out yeah. and camp and go for yeah. walks. Um, but it, it makes me think, and Chiara, I, I'd like to address this a bit to you. Um, the idea of confinement or the experience, the human experience of confinement isn't new. I mean, when you think there are a lot of people today, and this was something that actually came in one of the audience questions, is someone who said, what about people who are alone, who really are completely living alone? And, you know, and then you think about uh, elderly people today, many of whom have been isolated for years and barely ever see a soul. Um, or you think about people who in wartime, you know, let's say in Italy or in Germany during the Second World War, in Europe, who had to hide under floorboards alone and they couldn't go outside and they could barely move for months on end. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just curious about, you know, Chiara, when, when the Italians did go through that lockdown last spring where you could not leave the house except for very, very specific reasons. And you always had to take a signed so-called self-declaration with you that said, you know, I, Chiara Capelletto, I'm going on this day to the pharmacy to do this. Um, and because the police would check, um, that I just think that must have been extremely hard for Italians who are such a a physical culture, like much more than Canadians, who are so, um, where so much of Italian life is lived outdoors and in public. 
and in a sense is very performative. And, I, and I'm very interested in, of course, in the connection between Zab and Kiara and your, both of your interests in performance. So how was this, this loss of daily public ritual and this performative aspect of it, how, how do you think that affected Italians? Deeply, deeply. In our imaginations, in our self-confidence, in our self-awareness, and in our, uh, in our ability to uh, share our space with others. So I think that we have been and we still are deeply affected. And uh, um, listening to what Zab just said, uh, when, I mean, for, I, I think I can generalize, when uh, we have been told to stay home, that basically meant stay still. Uh, and this is why I, I started my, my, my presentation saying something about ho our houses. Because you have to imagine people who live in houses that are regular houses, meaning small. And you cannot walk in a small house, in a small living room. And I, I told Sasha when we met the first time that for some days my, my, my um, exit strategy was walking in, in, my, in my living room, trying to expand it. Uh, but I mean, that was just something that I tried to do because the stillness was really the, the, our experience of, uh, during the lockdown. So loneliness was a, 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 like a still frame, a still image. And, um, and again, you can, you can maybe imagine a, a, a 40 or 50 uh, year uh, old man staying home by himself, still watching TV. But imagine children, they cannot. Uh, young people, they cannot. And elderly people, they cannot either because they need to go out. So this confinement was, was designed for, a, for an abstract human being. And this is, has been very violent, I think. Um, the other question that you asked me, uh, what about people that are already alone? Well, I, I know that my, my, perspect, my perspective is somehow generational. So I, I, I'm, I, my word that when I say we, in fact, I mean the genera my generation, meaning between, I don't know, 25 and 50, I mean, people who uh, just live their life going around, um, moving, uh, knowing the world, um, changing cities, uh, flying to, to reach friends uh, in other countries. So our, our imagination and our experience of our daily world was much, much, much wider than the experience that we were allowed to have uh, during the lockdown. And this is not, uh, I mean, this is still working. We are now, I think that we are somehow um, avoiding to go out. It's a strange balance that we are trying to experience, but we are not self-confident when we go out. Yeah. I'm not saying that has to be all the time for, like that, but this is how it is now. We should dance a little more. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm interested in, um, in how all of this is also affecting um, public life and politics. And, um, uh, so, I, and, and so I, Zab, I'm going to ask you about that and then I'm going to ask Chiara about something. Um, Zab, um, you, you grew up in Congo Brazzaville um, when it was decolonizing itself. And um, your mother was French, your father was a Congolese revolutionary, I believe. Um, decolonization continues today with movements like Black Lives Matter. And it seems to me that what Black Lives Matter is fighting for has become even more urgent today. Um, how would you say, this is probably a humongous question, but how would you say that the body, and, and maybe you also want to include dance in that, has shaped movements like Black Lives Matter? Ooh, la la. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I'd like to say that, I mean, as you read before on the screen, being a body is a, is a performance in itself. And yes, uh, the body takes space. So the idea of distancing ourselves puts in question how we take space. It takes space and it breathes. Therefore, what shall we do? And how are we going to do it? Once we understand that, if that body needs to be alive, it needs to take space and breathe. Even in a close environment, even when it's being squashed by somebody else's knee, it's trying to breathe. If, even when there's no more possibility for us to escape, we still try to breathe. So whoever is taking care of the breath thing here, uh, 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 we are dealing with an, what I call um, ethics, which means that we cannot have a body being um, 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 called upon living with a body without having ethics. Inherently, the posture that we take is linked to ethics. And probably radically so, if we think of the body, the Black Lives Matter. Every one of us in this world now, by being alive, standing, having a body that takes space, needs to think in terms of ethics. How is my body taking space? And how is that space related to somebody else's body and space. So yes, we have been shocked by that, but this is, we've been shocked because we were on pause. We were on stillness. People were still, they were frozen in front of the screen and they had no choice but looking at that picture. But it's been happening for ages. It's been happening, happening, happening for years and years and centuries now, this thing. But for some reason, we saw it. People, captured that image and it, start, it started filling up their, 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 their thinking, their imagination, their fantasy even. It started taking up space in their body. This is why the Black Lives Matter sort of got a new sprung again, I would say, because it is something that occurred before, but it sprung again during what we call this, this confinement behind the screens. So, Yes, this is important, but it's important um, politically and historically, because those two are links. It's important now to see that, okay, we are sort of um, almost frozen in a situation that is happening now, but we should be inside of us. And this is why I was talking about reflecting as an action, an active reflecting. Through us, through our memory, history is circulating like a breath. The memory allows you to think of the things that either you've thought about, you've seen, you've known, you've decided to not know anymore, you've decided is not important. Now, how do we move our, our lives in history? And the, the way we relate to that memory, memory makes us capable of uh, reacting politically, of having a political uh, thinking. What am I gonna do? What is my responsibility? Because ethics means you are politically involved somehow with your situation, with what you are and who you are. So this is what I would say. It's quite, it's quite important that because this is what, uh, uh, in a way, <laughs> strangely, is the positive aspect. Strangely said, there is this positive aspect of awakening. People are being awakened violently, I would say. They're being awakened violently but is this new, first of all, as you said, Sasha? Haven't we gone through in the past, you know, through, through terrible situations? Uh, our ancestors went through? So how do we relate to the life of a human being in this, on this planet? You know, again, it sends us back to our situation and how, how capable we are of, of um, filling our bodies, not having antibodies, filling them with what is the life of a human being on earth. So feeling our body, again, becomes an ethical uh, standpoint. It's, it's, yeah, it's an ethical stand. 
Yeah. I don't know if I make myself understand, but uh, I talk about the body again. <laughs> and the political... <laughs> That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah, the body and the political body. Yeah. yeah. It's a political so, body. And, and connected to that, um, and I see we've technically just, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, but if everyone's okay, I'd like to extend this by about 10 minutes because I've a question connected to that that I'd like to ask Chiara, and then I'd like to be able to take at least a question from the audience. Um, so, um, connected to what you were just saying, Zab, to me is also like, yes, people are being awake, awakened quite violently, and some people, um, I think, are becoming much more aware of other people, much more empathetic. Um, at the same time, I'm concerned that a lot of other people are losing empathy and that we know through studies, through scientific studies, that empathy comes with physical touch. And, you know, if a child is raised with very little physical touch, chances are they won't become very empathetic. Um, I read a, a study last week where they had a, a mouse in a cage. They gave the mouse water and food for three months, but no mouse companion. Then they introduced um, a new mouse into the cage. The mice sniffed each other for a second, and then the mouse that had been isolated attacked viciously the other mouse. And I am wondering, is this spilling over, Chiara, this is now for you, is this spilling over into politics? We, you know, some of us saw the presidential debate last night, um, enormous lack of empathy on display there, at least from one of the candidates. And um, I'm wondering how is the, the empathy question, let's say, affecting politics in Italy these days? Uh, well, well uh, yes. Um, mm, I come back to what Zab just said about uh, um, feeling and feeling the the bodies, my my own body and the bodies and the others' body, uh, the bodies of the, of the others. And um, I'm afraid that uh, the lockdown, but I mean all this social distancing or this physical distancing, is working as a huge anesthetic. And uh, uh, there is a kind of uh, nice, uh, uh, mild depression going around. So everybody um, is somehow um, authorized to engage less, to touch the, other, the others less, to be less intrusive and to be less uh, aggressed but aggression is also, is also positive. I mean, this is the contact, is the, is the clash that you can have with the others, is the conflict. And conflict is, is I mean, without conflict, you, can have, you cannot have any political life. If there is no conflict, if there is no confrontation, you, you live in an empty and, 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 and frozen space by yourself. So I'm afraid that this, this um, social distancing flag has actually is actually changing our idea of public space within which we are we were um, allowed to engage uh, all together and to to be to be to to, 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 to be in conflict and to and also of course to to share our thinking and our feeling and this is a kind of a false peace it, it, it's a fiction it's a it's a um it's, a, it's, a, it's thorny because everything is going quite well. Nobody's aggressing, nobody else. I mean, here, I, I, not in the States, of course, not. but this, is, this has nothing to do with empathy, a friendship, um, help, uh, and it's rather linked to a kind of uh, non-aggression um, contract. You see, because we, can, we, do, we are not allowed to be in touch to touch each other and to be touched. But it's, it's a false perspective and it's a tricky one. And um, it could be uh, the, the, the it, it could open a, um, a, a, a political discourse based on a, a, a new huge form of egoism and, 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 uh, um, and fragmented, that would lead us to a fragmented society. So that actually ties into, I think, to a question now that comes from the audience. Um, I would say quite a lot of politics is made by men. 
Um, and one of our one of our um, audience says is commenting on the fact that this appears to be this is a, a woman's panel today that just happened and um, is wondering will the do do either of you or both of you have any thoughts on how the um, COVID nineteen um, pandemic will um, affect gender relationships will reflect gender uh, well sorry we're not reflecting on affect gender relationships, gender identities. Um, yeah. Does any, who, who'd like to address that one? I, that is it. <laughs> I can say something quickly about it. It's uh, the fact that we are uh, drawn back to the simple fact of being human, uh, a living human being first. Uh, starts is the fundamental uh, uh, fact that we need to retain here, and that's of course uh, beyond gender in that sense. Uh, there are living, living bodies, uh, and we are living bodies with the animals, with everything that is living. Uh, this is what's, what it's about right now, is the fact of life and carrying a body uh, to live. So that, that, that is the first thing I would say, uh, beyond saying anything else. Uh, it's an occasion for us to uh, to really uh, share the respect for life. Should I go? Do you have anything? Yeah, of course. Well, what what I've just said before, uh, referring to the, the strange citizen that has been imagined as as a, a actual uh, living being, uh, was a male, was a male citizen, was a was a man, uh, with no responsibilities for others and especially for, for vulnerable, vulnerable people. Um, so was my, this is my first point. I mean, the, 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 the management of the uh, pandemic is made by man for man. Uh, and the second point is that, uh, as we know, uh, women are the more uh, affected, both, I mean, economically, socially, on, on uh, personally by by these uh, um, by the, by the child I mean by the, the by the management of the pandemic, uh, women are supposed to stay home. Women, as we know, uh, have a, a lower income. So this is the reason why, if we have to choose the one who stay home, is the one that has a, a, a lower income, meaning the woman, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, even in within the academic world there is a huge gap uh, which is growing between not just women but parents, I mean people with children <laughs> and people without children. Because if you have to, if homeschooling is your daily practice and your daily life, well, you cannot work. So having children has uh, become once again a huge um, weakness. I mean, I do not agree with that. I'm not stating it. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, uh, saying what is obvious, if you have children in this moment, your life is much more, uh, your professional life, your economical life, your personal life uh, is much more in danger than if you have not uh, children at all. And this is deeply unfair, not just for the, the grown up, but for children also. Um, at the same time, I think that if, I mean, once again, uh, we as women can imagine all these things, I wouldn't say better, but surely in a more uh, nuanced way. Uh, I think that we have to, re to rethink what, citizen what citizenship is, what means to be part of a society. And there is, no only, there is no one way. I mean, there are a variety of experiences of, and of affects and of behaviors that we have to uh, deal with and, we, and that we should empower also. Um, and that can be an occasion. I mean, that should be also an occasion. So, uh, but we have to be more assertive maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'd like to add that, uh, the, of course, this is not a, a theme, but whoever's gonna take care of the theme care, uh, of course, um, this touch us, touches a lot on the idea of care because women have been the one identified as 
the caretakers, those who really take care of everyone, basically in the society, in the family, outside, even in the office, they take care of things. Uh, so the idea of care, this is the time. This is the time to totally review who is caring and how is this care uh, being, uh, you know, is happening. So it, it's a strong, um, it's a strong thing for that care and, and genders and the way they are working in the society. This needs to be totally reconfigured, I would say. But if I may add something, I do think that there is a generational issue here because, uh, for example, my, friends of mine or people of, of my generation, they, we have been uh, more capable of sharing responsibilities at home than older people. So we, cannot, we shouldn't have a, 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 um, just one discourse going on on what's going on uh, in, in, in families or, 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 in, or at work. Uh, there, there are many societies uh, intricated in this moment and we should be able enough to see each of them each of these groups of people, because there is no, there is no just one narrative uh, going on. And this is very important. If we, if we forget to see these differences at work, I think that we, lose a, we miss a huge opportunity. I absolutely agree. So I, um, I would like to ask one other question um, to, to end off with that incorporates a question from the audience. Um, so a lot of people have used the pandemic as a reset and are actually maybe taking better care of their bodies than they did. They're maybe being more mindful of what they eat. They're being more conscious of exercise. Uh, but of course, for many other people, it's been very, very challenging. Um, you know, there's maybe more overeating. I mean, we, we hear about that all the time, that alcohol use is certainly going way up. Um, and and as a result, you know, there's also more, there's more depression, which Chiara, you've talked about. Um, and very clearly, mind and body are completely interconnected. They are, you know, they, they are one. And we cannot have this dichotomy that there's the mind and there's the body. Um, now we're going into a situation where um, it looks like there are some new restrictions coming in. It looks like there may be some lockdowns coming down, maybe not as, as, as harsh as before, but it's not going to just be like the summer. I think we can be pretty sure of that. So um, my final question to you both is, you know, briefly, what advice would you give to people to help get them through a potentially long COVID winter or, you know, until we have a vaccine and possibly, you know, have you seen creative solutions from other people. It's, so you can answer that as, as you like. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going back to uh, uh, the capacity we have to reflect on our own situation that I suggested earlier on. And now, how, how capable are we uh, to do that, basically, in doing this? How capable are the people to start really thinking about their lives and what they do? and how they do about it. This needs to be addressed because if I look at uh, what happened, the government here, when we started the pandemic in the summer, some um, rule came out uh, regarding essential services. This needs to be maintained, but this cannot open. And what was considered essential, certainly not the dancing uh, studios, which were not part of even of the reflection, what was considered essential service is the Société des Alcools, where you buy alcohol. We co I could not believe it. I remember talking about it with friends and they say that they maintain that with grocery stores and pharmacies and alcohol, where you buy alcohol. And cannabis. You know, and cannabis, you know? So which, that, that, that is striking. It tells you, okay, this is, is a, an essential service. But anything with, with, with body, exercise, yoga, all those things, gone, closed. So this tells you that the people, who, whoever reflected that, <laughs> has, has thought about it, thinks of, let, let's, let's make sure that those people are going to be quiet and they're going to have their thing to stay quiet at home, you know, get drunk and stay quiet at home instead of going to move. So, and also, um, Put you, putting you to sleep, 
almost, you know? So we need to really seriously think about, um, uh, yeah, what are, what are these governments? Who are these, govern these governments? Where are the governments by, for the people and by the people? Do we have these governments? And are we people? How are we as people to take charge of the fact that we are occupying the space? We use space. Or should we just die uh, uh, precautiously in order to leave space for others? Or are we ready to fight for our lives? So there needs to be uh, some kind of a, I think it takes courage. We need courage. We need courage in the families. We need courage as, 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 as people everywhere. But that courage needs to be shared with others. So whatever happens, we need to maintain the contacts, our capacity to connect with others and think with others, discuss with others. Uh, seriously, uh, not having, not being afraid. I think either Sasha or maybe uh, Chara, you mentioned the right to, to try and fail. Not being afraid of failing together if we tried that. But the fact that we're together means we did not fail. That's what we need to maintain. So I think that is really essential. I mean, in the in closing other, we need to really grasp that idea of, of being with others, no matter what, finding ways of connecting with others and maintain that connection while governments edit laws and edit rules. Uh, this is about us. We cannot not be there. Wonderful. And um, Kiara, would you like to respond? Well, I, I share everything that Zab just said. I just uh, I think that there is, in fact, a, a critical inertia here and that uh, uh, it, it's very dangerous. And we should rethink deeply, uh, basically, the notion of life. I mean, living is risky and, yeah. and being sick and unfortunately die mm -hmm. is part of, live, of our life. And I'm not, I mean, I want to stay alive as long as possible. Uh, I don't want to banalize anything at all. I do not diminish any, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a dangerous situation. I'm not saying it's not, but there is a kind of nevrosis of keeping ourselves alive no matter what. But there is, there is no uh, understanding of what a good life is. Uh, and. It, it, there is a paradox, it's a paradoxical situation because somehow we, we have to be alive as bodies, but the bodily necessities that we have as human beings, they are, they are completely neglected and censored. So let's clarify what, is, what a body is. It's just a biological agent, uh, is a natural precondition. I'm confused, let's say, because uh, of, I mean, as, as Zab just showed us, bodies are agents, are, are, are media of passions and affects and relations and connections. Uh, bodies are not um, boxes to be maintained intact. That's not what bodies are and that's not what human beings are. So we should manage better the risk of being alive. Well, uh, Zab Mubungu and Kiara Capaletto, I would like to thank you both very, very much for this conversation. It's been um, very inspiring, very provocative, um, very human, I think. Uh, very, very, um, yeah, very inspiring. Um, so thank you both very, very much. Thank you. And then I'd also like to thank um, Alessandro Ruggera, Gloria Di Folco, and Luisa Trisi with the Italian Cultural Institute. Uh, I would also like to um, acknowledge the help of Leonora Moncada and Carla Etienne with Niata Niata in Montreal. And uh, a very big thank you to my co-curator and co-moderator of this series, Francesca Moltini in Milan. And jumping in here, jumping in here, sorry, Alessandro again, just because Sasha's 
video seems to be frozen and I can't hear anymore. No, I, I just would like to join uh, to join uh, Sasha and to thank you very, very much. It has been a terrific conversation and both your contribution, uh, Zab and Chiara, has been incredible. I'm sure we'll have a lot of uh, people following us again for the next conversation and the next one will be will be uh, in a week from now. So <clears throat> next uh, Thursday we'll, we'll have a conversation about uh, breath with uh, Philip Beasley and and um, the director of the of the botanical garden in um, in uh, Palermo um, Paolo Inglese. It's uh, again Thank you so much. Thank you to Sasha. I'm so sorry that Sasha missed the last part of the conversation, but technical is made to help us and to show us that we can not rely on tech on, te on the technical. We can the rely on bodies. Yes, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> luckily. So I mean it's yeah. like the, the sudden absence of, of uh, Sasha is a message itself, so that we can uh, we we can um, reflect on upon it. So thank you again, and um, thank you again to all the staff of the Instituto. It's, uh, for us, it's, it has been really tough to go through this pandemic and not having the public that we usually have, the audience uh, joining us here physically. And uh, it's great to have Gloria and Tiziana and uh, the rest of the staff helping to put up this um, series of conversations. And thank you again, Zab and Chiara, and to all those who are listening from Italy and from Canada. Take care, everyone, and see you in a week. Bye-bye. Thank you.